from the epistle of St. Paul the Apostle to the Ephesians, chapter 3, verse 17. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So you're driving along, and uh, your route intersects with that of a funeral procession. And if you're a jerk, you keep on driving. You may actually beep your horn at people who are slowing you down because, of course, what you are doing is so urgent and important. If you have decent manners, you'll pull over to the side of the road and wait for the procession to pass. And if you fear God, you'll remember your own mortality, the thing you share with the person who's gone to their grave, and offer up a prayer. All those are possibilities for us. When we run into a funeral procession, what's unthinkable is that we should do what Jesus did. To get in front of the procession, to, tell, to stop, to tell the mourners not to cry, to bring out the coffin, pry up the lid, and tell the dead man, get up. That is what happened when Jesus and his disciples and a, quite a crowd of people came to the little town of Nain. They run into a funeral procession, a young man being carried to the grave, the only son of the widow, which means for her at that time and place that she was facing an empty future of loneliness and poverty dependent on the goodwill of neighbors and strangers. And seeing her, Jesus is moved with compassion. He shares her grief, but he also takes command. He tells her not to weep. He puts his hand on the beer itself in blatant defiance of the taboo against contact with the dead. And he tells the dead young man, get up, arise. And when he is risen, Jesus hands him over to his mother and that whole sad funeral procession turns into, well, I guess a first century equivalent of a ticker tape victory parade. The authority and power of God's kingdom has been revealed in astonishing terms. And the astonished crowd testifies that a great prophet is risen up among us and that God hath visited his people. Which is to say that in the person of Jesus, they perceive the power and authority of God's kingdom, and God himself is not far away, but near. Not absent, but present. And powerfully at work in compassion and in command, turning death into life and sorrow into joy. That's what happens when Jesus comes to town. When Jesus comes, God visits his people. God comes near to his people. The infinite God makes himself present within our finite context. And in Christ, of the grace and power of God to save is made available. Up close and personal, near and not far. We don't need Jesus at a distance. He's of no use to us at a distance. We need him near at hand, up close and personal, in compassion and in command, as Lord and as Savior. We need him as close as we can get him. And that's why Paul prays for the Christians of Ephesus that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Up close and personal. And what these words indicate is that when you believe in Christ, you're not only believing certain things about him, like he was born or died and rose again. You're not just believing, you're receiving him. The whole Christ. And you're receiving him in the heart. The inmost core, the personality. The control room of the soul. The seat not only of feeling, but of knowing and judging and deciding. So when we believe in Christ and in the gospel, Paul says, Christ doesn't remain at a distance. 
He walks in the front door. He takes up permanent residence in the very core of our personality. And he does so with full command and full compassion. When he does so, Paul says, we'll be rooted and grounded in love. We'll find his love for us and our love for one another, the ground in which to put down roots, the firm foundation on which to build our lives. And that's because in faith, Paul says, we're made able to comprehend the height, the breadth, the length, and the depth of the love of Christ, revealed in the four dimensions of the cross. A love so broad that it embraces every kind of sinner, all sorts and conditions of men, in forgiveness rather than judgment. A love so long that it lasts through all time and to eternity and will never let us down. A love so deep that death and hell itself cannot separate us from it. A love so high that it brings us to God as the beloved children of the Father. When Christ dwells in our hearts by faith, Paul says, we are enabled to know the love of Christ which passes knowing. We are filled with all the fullness of God. You see, the infinite God making himself present in our finite context, in our finite humanity, in all his infinite grace and power to save and bless. God visits his people. God not absent but present, not distant but near, not outside but inside, turning death into life, sorrow into joy. As hymn 344, which was sung this Sunday, puts it, O oh, love, how deep, how broad, how high, how passing thought and fantasy that God, the Son of God, should take our mortal form for mortal's sake. Of course, the Christians that Paul is praying for are already believers. He's not praying for their initial conversion. Christ is already dwelling in their hearts by faith, as he is also in ours if we believe. But like the father of the epileptic boy, who cried out, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief, it is the case that we both believe and don't believe. And Paul is showing us that what we need to pray for is that our faith and love in Christ might grow. That we might grow in trust and hope and obedience to Christ. That we might receive him more fully, more deeply, more transformatively. And let me make a rather obvious point. Christ can't dwell in your hearts by faith if you've got the front door locked. He can't dwell in your hearts if you decide to keep him in the front parlor with the best teacups, poised at the edge of a chair. He can't dwell in your hearts by faith if you're trying to keep him as a guest, which is really a way of keeping him at a distance. Because he is the Lord. He can't dwell in your hearts if you're the Lord. He can't dwell in your hearts if you're trying to stay in control of your thoughts and decisions and feelings, your time and energy, your life. He can't dwell in your hearts by faith if you don't surrender command to him of your mind, your will, your body, your time, your energy, and yes, in stewardship season, your wallet. To quote another classic hymn, were the whole realm of nature mine, that were present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. We all have many fears, many problems, many needs and worries. But our greatest need above them all is for the indwelling of Christ by faith. The very grace, in fact, we pray for in the Holy Communion, that he may dwell in us and we in him. Is that too much to ask for? Paul doesn't think so. God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, he says. According to the power that worketh in us, according to his infinite power that turns death into life and sorrow into joy. The great Anglican divine of the last century, Austin Ferrer, put it this way, We do not come to God for a little help, a little support to our own good intentions. 
we come to him for resurrection. God will not be asked for little. He will be asked for all. Let us ask indeed for all. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end.